in this, our next phase, we want to welcome Lori Bolin. Lori is a wife, mom, and grandmother, and also a person in long-term family recovery. She's a certified Balm Family Recovery Life Coach, a facilitator of the Balm 12 Principles, an ICF Certified Life Coach, an in-house coach for Balm Family Recovery resources, a faculty member of the Balm Training Institute for Family Recovery Services, and the founder of Building Bridges to Recovery, not-for-profit. Lori's life has been touched deeply by substance use disorder, so she understands the impact SUD has on families and friends. Her mission is to help families build bridges to recovery in their homes committed to empowering families affected by substance use disorder, heal and unite. Lori engages her strong belief in our universal connectedness to help families recognize the profound impact of SUD, untie the knots of confusion that accompany it and restore the peace and calm families crave in the midst of the chaos. She partners with family members and friends to deepen their own personal recovery, which enables them to love unconditionally, connect on a deeper level, and promote health and healing. That is such a beautiful bio, Lori. Thank you. Lori, you've been in relationship with persons facing SUD your entire life. Growing up, what kind of modeling did you see in your family in terms of how to relate to the loved ones struggling with the SUD? And what evidence did you see of loving conversations? Um, well, what kind of role modeling did I see was um, shame. Uh, we don't talk about this. Um, we put on a mask, we, and not a 2021 mask, we put on a mask and pretend that this isn't, you know, this isn't happening. No one, it's, it's like this wall and no one can know what's happening back there. Right. So very, very much, um, a, an atmosphere of, of, of shame and stigma and, and judgment and, um, anger and fear, fear. We were, you know, as, as children, one of my very first memories as a, as a, as a, from growing up is being a small child. Um, I was like four or five. My sister was two or three and we were in the back of the car late at night, dark outside. I remember being terrified and we were sitting outside a bar and my mom was trying to get my dad to come home. So there was, it's, it's like, it's, it's all that shame, fear, stigma, judgment, anger. Uh, and we didn't, and, and nothing was talked about. Nothing was talked about. And uh, my mom definitely covered for my dad big time. Um, there's no judgment in that statement either. It was 50 years ago. You know, that's kind of, that was pretty normal. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so what evidence did I see of loving conversations? Really none, none. Cause like I said, we just, we didn't talk about it. It was, that was off limits as a topic of conversation. It must've been so scary for you and your sister. It was frightening at times. And, and, um, in the, in the height of it, in the worst of it, there were times where, uh, you know, we would be awakened in the middle of the night to things being thrown or pounded on or broken or so. Yeah, some days it was. So when you grew up and got married, how did you deal with your husband's and your daughter's use? Well, at the beginning, um, I basically went with what I knew. So what do I mean by that? I mean, we didn't really talk about it. 
there was anger, there was shame, there was judgment, um, a lot of yelling. <laughs> um, how can you do this to me? Uh, you know, those that that's that sort of um, attitude, that sort of attitude. You're doing this to me. Um, and, and how dare you? How long did that go on? Um, let's see. For a very long time. Um, with my with my husband first, it was, we weren't married very long. And, um, you know, I, I found out he was still doing substances that he had said he had quit. Um, and then there was that whole piece of, you know, denying it and everything. And, um, somehow this amazes me that I was able to do this, but this one time I would, I did stay very calm and I just said, well, not very calm, but relatively calm. And I said, um, it's a mirror and a razor blade and a white powder substance. Don't tell me that you're not doing this. Um, oh, and, yeah. Yeah. and with our daughter, with our daughter, unfortunately, it was um, many, many years of the The yelling and the shaming and the judging and the, and the how dare you and I and you were raised better than this. Bless her heart. How many times I said that to her. And meanwhile, the whole thing with your daughter started with a car accident, right? And yes, medicine that she was given because she had pain. Yes, yes. The girls were in a very serious car accident, and for a while we weren't sure that that um, Megan, our second daughter, was. They were both in the car. Um, we weren't sure if she was going to even make it, you know, and she had a traumatic brain injury. And so there were part of her skull went in like in this V shape into her brain. So they had to do surgery and, you know, take get that out and then repair it. And um, after that, you know, they, they call you into this big conference room with like it, the whole team, you know, and, um, you know, the neurosurgeon said, I've done everything I can do. If you're praying people, I suggest that you do that. Mm. So yes, it all started with that now. Um, and then she had a really long road to recovery. She was in the trauma unit for about a month, a step down unit for a week. And then she was in patient physical rehab for six months and outpatient for another year. She, she had to learn how to do everything all over again. Eat, sleep, feed her, not sleep, eat, drink, feed herself, brush her teeth. I mean, like everything, everything. And yes, there was a lot of pain. There were broken bones that were missed because the brain was the major focus. So, um, and this was 20 years ago. So I'm sorry. Yeah, 20 years ago. Uh, so we didn't know what we know now about opioids and she got, she got addicted to them. So you had quite a journey until you got into Balm and she had a couple of overdoses along the way. Yes. You were in Al-Anon, you were getting help from 12 step programs in church, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. And that something happened when you got into the Balm. Could you talk about what you learned about the value of the balm approach. Yes, yes. Um, when, when I got in the balm, it was, it was this. Well, I got my introduction through a friend who was already in the balm and in coach training. And it was an Al-Anon slash work friend. And I would listen to him talk about the balm. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's it. <laughs> That's what's missing because I had been in Al-Anon for about three years when I got, when I got into the balm. And so, you know, I had some, some good recovery, 
started there, but it just, there was like something was missing. I, I, I found myself saying, okay, this is great. And what now what? It just felt like, and so when I started talking to my friend and he was talking about the balm and I'm like, that's it. That is the missing piece because it's that, it's that connection. You know, it's that foundation in love and staying connected and not the stiff arm uh, that we had given her for literally decades. Um, not of your, it wasn't your own fault and any families that are out there, whether you've lost a loved one, you still have your loved one. If you have been caught on the tough love wheel, there's no judgment there. We were all schooled in it. We were right. taught that there was value to it. And we still may be going places where they're telling us to use it. You just offer a different approach. Yes. Yes. And you're right. You're absolutely right. That is what we were told. You know, this is what, this is what she needs. I'm so glad you said like, there's no judgment and we've all been there. I fight. I used to have a lot of judgment on myself after I got here and realized, Oh man, this has been available all this time. Um, but I finally got to the point where I was like, okay, I did the best I could with what I knew at that point in time. And really that's true all of life, right? We do the best we can at any given point with what we know at that point. So I know differently now, so I get to make different choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how did the balm change your approach to your daughter? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so um, I know that you have heard me say this and some, some other people have. Um, but it's just such the truth. The balm gave me my daughter back. And what do I mean by that? That sounds so silly, doesn't it? Um, but what I mean by that, and, and what I mean by that is it's the relationship. Like the relationship started being restored even before um, she got in recovery. Uh, it was you know, this, this was my baby girl. And so every conversation did not have to be consist of me judging and shaming her and telling her what she needed to do and when she needed to do it and how she needed to do it. And sometimes it just became about, Hey, want to go get coffee? Hey, want to go to the mall? You know, or just, you know, come over and visit and, you know, just be silly sometimes. You know, my daughter actually has this really quirky, fun sense of humor. <laughs> so it's just be. That's what it is. We were we were able to just be. Even though, so she, then, even though, even though she was still using, yeah. Talk about that for families that might feel like, well, I have to save them. I can't forget that at any moment that they need to be fixed yeah so um I, so the bomb helped me see my daughter isn't a problem that needs to be fixed she's a person that deserves my love unconditional love and support now does that mean that i don't pay attention to the fact that she's using? Oh, no, it doesn't mean that. I'm not in denial. I'm very aware of what's going on. And I get to choose when to have those little drip, drip, drip balm conversations. And I get to choose when we get to just hang out and be. Be mom and make, and there's balance. That's beautiful. So um, a question that I have for you is, have you noticed any different outcomes as a result? And we don't promise outcomes in the bowl. We just say, you'll become her best chance. So as you were becoming her best chance, were there any specific outcomes? Did things change in any way? 
So, you know, the, the first two overdoses happened pre bomb and, um, man, I, I went like back to that old behavior of, I mean, way old from my childhood of, we didn't even talk about it. Mm-hmm. And when I hear, hear myself say that, I think, wow, that's just really unusual. <laughs> Um, but that's just, I mean, and, and that was, that was it. That was just how we dealt. We didn't have tools, so we didn't talk about it. Now, between the second one and the third one, we got, you know, enter the ball, you know, enter some new tools, enter some new uh, peacefulness, mindfulness, awareness, um, documenting, um, you know, all those things. And, um, you know, those powerful questions that are part of motivational interviewing. And for us, a big, a a big one was that, um, just developing discrepancy. Um, and, and it would just be, you know, there were times where she would say, I'm just so tired of this mom. I just don't want to, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And I don't know how to get out of it. You know, or, or sometimes it was just, oh, I'm so tired of this. I don't want to do this, you know, and just simple things like, well, wow, Meg, I hear you saying that, that, uh, you know, you don't want to live like this anymore. How are your, how are your actions supporting that goal? What are, what are some things you could do differently? Um, because she was, she felt stuck because she had been in this culture for so long. Um, it was 18 years. So, you know, she, she made this progression from alcohol, marijuana, opioids, meth, and then meth. So, and then the meth years were about nine. And her overdoses were all meth overdoses? They were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so she was stuck. She felt stuck. And simple little questions of, well, what's one thing you can do? Mm-hmm. You know, um, just she starts thinking. And it's not my telling her because she had decades of, you know, my telling her I knew what was best. Um, So just helping her to feel empowered. Oh yeah, I can make a different decision. You know, It, it, it sounds like it should be so intuitive, but bless her heart, she was so stuck that she didn't believe she could make a different decision until we had this little shift that was a major shift in how we interacted and how we talked and you know light bulbs started going off she she doesn't have one of she we don't have one of those stories where it just clicked we have one of those stories where it was drip 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 stay the course stay the course practice practice fall fall you know, two steps forward, one step back is still progress. Right. So you said that she did have an overdose when you were practicing balm. Could you talk about mm-hmm. that? Yeah. So, okay. So what was different this time was, um, you know, we didn't ignore it. We didn't ignore it. So we talked about it. Um, talked about things like, um, what was going on? You know, where were you? Who were you with? What were you thinking? You know, what was going through your mind? Um, now, a lot of those, I'll be honest, a lot of those questions, she just didn't remember. Part of it's the brain injury. Part of it is just, you know, n- n- nine years of math, right? Uh, they, st- they still had value though. Because it planted seeds, I believe it still had value because it, I believe it planted seeds um, in her of 
thought processes for the future, right? So we didn't ignore it. We talked about it. We continued talking. Um, things like this. You know, Meg, I noticed this, this, and this. And historically, when those behaviors show up, um, it's because you've been using. So, and, and you know, it's like, it's that, it's that just, it's that pointing it out, right? It's staying, staying with the facts. No, no judgment, right? There's no judgment in, I notice. Historically, this has meant. It's just what is. Right. Simply yeah. every, all the cards are on the table. Exactly. And what opened her up to being willing to have all the cards on the table with you? Um, I really think that it is, I was different. So I, I, I always say, when we talk about the seven steps, step one is step one for a reason. <laughs> you know, it's that be, be the peace. So oh, over time, I was able to build trust with her that she could come tell me stuff and I wasn't going to freak out. And how did you get to the point of not freaking out about really freak outable stuff? <laughs> freak outable stuff. I love that word. <laughs> um, A whole lot of practice. Man, I wish I could say it just happened, but it didn't. It was a whole lot of practice and a whole lot of work. And, um, you know, I, I, took, I took the seven steps class five times when I was in coach training. <laughs> there it was. Um, yes. Yes. And, and I used to, I used to practice my bomb conversations with my coach. Um, but, but yeah, it's a whole lot of practice. It's, it's that finding, finding the peace practice that worked for me. And then just being consistent, being consistent, being consistent, asking for support when I needed it, asking for help when I needed it. Those early days, I relied on my coach a lot. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you, you know, often we talk about our loved one needing to rebuild trust with us and I needed to rebuild trust with her because my, my pattern was anger, judgment, shame. You know what, Lori, I think if a lot of us are, are honest, the same thing is true. I mean... We can spend a lot of time not trusting our loved one and sit in that and not face the fact that we may not be trustable as calm, responsive, rather than reactive people. Food for thought to everyone. Watch yourself. Here's an assignment. Be aware this week. Just watch yourself. When you hear upsetting news, do you react or do you take it in? Breathe mm -hmm. and just stop if you're going to respond or sit on it for a while. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great assignment. Wise words. So, and I think it's not a one and done thing either. Right. Wow. You days know, and day, day out. in and day out, right? I, I have to stay aware. Yes, yes. Over the years, Over recovery years. is a lifelong journey for loved ones, for family members. And it's so wonderful to be on that journey with you, Lori. Oh, yes. Thank you. I am honored to be on it with all of you. <laughs> well, we thank you for sharing. And is there, are there any last words of wisdom that you would like to share with our families? Um, oh, thank you. Um, whew, what would I like to say? Okay, so here's, 
here's a big one that I learned. Um, and it's uh, about being calm, being peaceful, watching our tone. Right. And uh, I realized that oftentimes my, my, the message got lost in the delivery. So now I'm very intentional about all those aspects, right? My tone, my volume, um, my facial expressions, because I do not have a poker face, right? Um, so because I don't, I don't want that, to, I don't want the message to get lost in the delivery. Beautiful. Um, yeah. Don't and let and can I, yeah. lost in the delivery. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. all beautiful, Lori. And can I just say, I know we don't promise any guarantees, but I want to give uh, some encouragement because for for us, you know, it's been almost a 20-year journey. And she's a year and a half sober now. Wow. So wow. Yeah. That's just precious. It is. It is beyond words. When you think about that, did you expect it or was it unexpected, the recovery? <gasps> That's an interesting question. Um, I think I did expect it. I, I don't know that I expected it on a on a conscious level, um, but there's, her story is, is a miracle from the car accident till, there's so many miracles in there of things that happened that just were not coincidences, that somehow, like way down deep inside of myself, I just knew that it was gonna be okay. And by the way, by okay, I don't mean that she was going to get sober. When I found the piece of step one, it was, I knew it was going to be okay no matter what happened. Um, and yet, I, I, I wasn't like super duper shocked when, you know, she was, she has got a year and a half. We just celebrate, you know, like. Okay, and we still talk about, okay. Um, you know, if I start seeing patterns, I, I still document them. You know, I don't think we can ever give up on that. Now, lots of times now I get to document positive things, you know, but still, if I notice, I'm like, okay, hmm, that's once, okay, jot it down. Um, but then, if, you know, if I see it again or again, then I'll say, hey, Meg, I kind of noticed, this to do, do, do um something going on you know what's going on um so it's a journey it's just a journey it's a lifelong journey and i'm so i'm so stinking happy just to be on it <laughs> you know like with all of you megan she she loves the balm you know she says I say the bomb gave me my daughter back. She says the bomb gave me my mom back. That's and now Lizzie says, when you die, I'm going to be in the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope she doesn't write me off too soon, but you know, bring it up the next generation. Very cute. Thank you again, Lori. Thank you. I really appreciate it.